Class next Sunday, just so you're planning. We won't have a class on Easter. We're still seeing if we're going to have an eight o'clock service along with the 10 o'clock. I told us yesterday, I just took a look in the afternoon. Uh, the 10 o'clock service is filling up. No one had signed up for eight o'clock yet. So I don't know what the future of that will be. Stay tuned. That's right. Pastor? Yes. Okay, today everybody's supposed to bring their mission money in. Yes. Okay, so um, the checks would go to Gary, right? No, they run through Mary Lynn into the uh, Women's Guild of Health. Well, we already have at least a hundred dollars to help us contribute to the plate. Okay. So if we get any plate contributions today, I will just write one check. Okay, that's fine. I'm sorry, I'm so scared. That's fine. I got one. I mean, I did. No, I mean, I, I think I did it for resurrection. Well, that's what we're supposed to do. Yeah. Resurrection with uh, the and the and It should be written to the church, otherwise it won't get published. Can I put it through them? Yeah. That's fine. Right. Otherwise, the Women's Guild account is also called Resurrection Lutheran Church. Thank it you. doesn't say Women's Guild on it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter. I'll do okay. Yeah. You will get credit. Oh, yeah. That would be a different account. I totally yeah. different account. So if that's it okay. came to the church, it's going into the church's account. Then if the checks go to Mary Lynn or Pastor, then she will put them in the women's group. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You know, you, the, the advantage to running it through the church account is that it'll go through the financial secretary, right? And then Mark will have his ability to have his position. So you, you get. You could, it's a tax advantage that way, although it's pretty minimal, I would think, unless you're given a thousand dollars. I don't think we, I don't think they do that anymore. I don't think we've done deductions for the last couple of years. Yeah, you might be right. What if they raise the uh, standard deduction? I, I don't know. I just give my taxes to a guy and he does it. I never have enough. Yeah. Yep. Anybody coming in? Yeah. I'm going to start it and then hand it over to Victor. information on Friday, the Wells Christian Life Resources, CLR, which is our you know, Lutherans for Life branch, you know, the, the life issues, issued a statement, position statement on vaccination. So Pastor Fleischman has been getting inundated with people asking him questions about the COVID-19 vaccination, given the fact that it used uh, stem cell lines from uh, abortions, whatever, how many, however long ago. He wrote a fourth, well, he along with others, I suppose, wrote a 14 page position statement. The Conference of Presidents had an opportunity to review it. I found nothing objectionable in it at all. In fact, it's very well done. Um, the first uh, eight pages or so are, are uh, passages from scripture which talk about our responsibility, our, uh, that, that you know, God is first in our lives and we honor him with all that we do. Our neighbor comes second and ourselves last. 
and what we owe our government, et cetera. So the, the first part of it is a lot of Bible passages and doctrinal uh, positions. Then the last part of it goes then into a little bit more practicality. And he, the, the statement comes out on the side, that you're not being complicit in abortion if you receive a vaccination that you use the stem cell line um, complicit. And he uses the analogy that many of you own a vehicle that was produced by a corporation that supply that provides health care for its workers. That health care plan covers abortion. So by buying a vehicle from them, some of that money that you paid for that is going to support that health care program, which provides abortion, covers abortion. You're not complicit. Uh, you know, if you if if your um, if your criteria is no sin needs can be committed for me to purchase this or to participate in this, you will do nothing. It, it dawned on me, you know, I, I, on Thursday I produced this Bible class. If your if your position is no sin can be committed for me to participate in this, well, I guarantee you, I probably sinned while producing it. I, I might not have used my abilities to the best that I could. So be careful on, on how you do that. However, if you're con you need to listen to your conscience. If your conscience bothers you about this, then you shouldn't do it. Um, so uh, a good position, you can find it on the Weld website. So uh, anybody else got any quick questions on this? It's rather lengthy, but it, it's, it's just very, very helpful. Um, this morning, we had Mark chapter nine. If you read through it ahead of time, you have some quick questions. It's a little tougher chapter. That's why I'm having Vicar do it. <laughs> yeah, Jesus, you know, Jesus is just running through things here as he's leading up to uh, his time at, at, in Jerusalem. And going to Calvary's cross, and, and these things just come very quickly. Anybody? All right, let's begin with a prayer, and then I'm gonna hand it. I'll start the video and then hand it over to Victor. Lord, as uh, we draw near to the end of Lenten season, we are continually reminded of the depths of your love for us—a love that caused you to go all the way to Calvary's cross for each and every one of us. And in your love, you've made us members of your kingdom by faith in you, and an opportunity to grow in our uh, citizenship in that kingdom by faith in you as we study your word this morning. Send us your Holy Spirit as we focus our attention on Mark chapter 9. Help us see the truths for our eternal life and for our daily lives in this chapter. Uh, help us be the, the people you have made us to be as we go out into the world and share your gospel, your saving gospel with others. We pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, Mark chapter 9. Yes. Yes. I I can see I can see if I can get one. The one I had was a draft and it did have a typo or two in it, but I, I will try that. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Whoops. Thank you, Victor. Sure glad he's running Bible class today. <laughs> I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world who bleached them. There appeared before them 
Elijah and Moses who were talking to Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, they looked around. They no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down, Jesus gave them orders not to tell any what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, why did the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wish, just as it is written about him. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet. And he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him kindly, Why couldn't we drive it down? He replied, This kind can come out only by prayer. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What are you arguing about on the road? 
but they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. For no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. All of you have Mark 9 either printed out or you have a Bible handy, yes? And all of you have also the handout, the Gospel according to Mark. All right. I don't see any panicked books. Let's get started. Uh, in this chapter, Jesus especially deals with misconceptions about himself, about his ministry, and about his mission. That's a theme we see woven throughout. So with that in mind, number one, what event was Jesus referring to when he said, truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste that before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. The kingdom of God coming with power. When did that happen? The resurrection. It did come at the resurrection. True. Um, there's another time. So, so yes, especially Jesus' passion and his resurrection. Um, some scholars will also say maybe this refers more specifically to Pentecost. Uh, when uh, from the Spirit, the Holy Spirit came and was the birthplace, the birthday of the Christian church. Um, so I would agree, God's kingdom is definitely, God's power is definitely displayed in the resurrection. Um, also, at Pentecost, so. Um, when we talk about the kingdom of God, and often in the gospels, we say the kingdom of God is God's ruling activity among men. So, uh, especially at Pentecost, that's when <coughs> The Holy Spirit comes and brings many to faith. It's easy to see God ruling in the hearts of people through his word. 
Number two, Mark uses the phrase after six days to connect what's coming to what just happened. Uh, so what do these two events have to do with each other? We're at a little bit of a disadvantage if you only have the printout. What had Jesus just said at the end of chapter eight? Uh, he predicted his death. Oh, Pastor? Yeah, yeah. He said that when it suffer, die, and rise again. Yeah. And the disciples, you know, Peter said, don't know Jesus. Correct. So Jesus just finishes saying, I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again. And for you and me, this is like basic stuff. If you know anything about Christianity, this is what you know. Jesus died on the cross to take away my sin. For the disciples, this was not what they expected at all. This was a hard teaching for them. So Jesus just finished his telling them, I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again. What's coming is the transfiguration, where Jesus clearly displays his divinity, his divine power. Jesus is not just a man, but is in fact the Son of God. These are connected. The reason the Son of God came to earth is to die and rise again, to win our salvation. And the only way that Jesus can die and then actually rise again, as he predicted, is if he is the Son of God. Jesus' nature, both to man and to God, uh, that can be kind of a, a heady, cerebral information kind of thing. It's tied up in everything Jesus did for you. If Jesus isn't who he says he is, he can't do what he says he's done. But because he is true God and true man, he has won your salvation completely. When Jesus is transfigured, where did his radiance come from? From God, from himself. Yeah, this is divine radiance. This is God's glory displayed in him. It's from himself. When we're in heaven, uh, I want to be a little careful here, but I, I, I'll be displaying God's glory. I won't be in heaven so great because I'm so great. I'll be there as a testament to what God has done in and through me. Jesus doesn't need external glory. He is true God. For he displays the full glory of the Father in himself. Why did Moses and Elijah appear and not some other notable Old Testament figures? Disclaimer. Scripture doesn't say. So... <laughs> I'm willing to go into a little bit of speculation. Um, scripture doesn't specifically say this is why Moses and Elijah came, but there would be some good reasons. Uh, what might this have meant to the disciples, maybe especially in the context of Jesus predicting his death and resurrection? And since we don't know, no wrong answer. Moses was of the Pentateuch, and Elijah, the first of the uh... Uh, of the prophets in the sense he was a greater. So often the Old Testament scriptures are divided into, depending on who you're talking to, sometimes they're divided into two sections, Moses and the prophets. Jesus talks that way. And when Jesus talks about Moses and the prophets, he's talking about all of Old Testament scripture. So Moses and Elijah the prophet come and talk with Jesus about his coming resurrection this could be remind or come to the disciples that really their whole Bible predicts this. Uh, this is what all of the scriptures have been leading up to is what Jesus is about to do. Die and rise again. Other thoughts. That's not the only angle you can take. Did it have something to do with the way that they were carried up to heaven? Yeah, so Jesus is talking about his death and resurrection. Well, Jesus can't die. He's the Messiah. And what does resurrection even mean? Well, Moses was, when he died and was buried by God, nobody saw him. So there was, God took a direct hand in his death and carried him to heaven. And also, Elijah was carried up in a whirlwind with chariots of fire. So also he didn't die by natural causes. He was taken directly up to heaven. 
So those are Old Testament reminders that God is in control of that. So if Jesus is who he says he is, then it's not maybe so far-fetched to believe that he will rise from the dead. Your own Bible tells you that. Must be hard for the disciples to understand, obviously, because uh, they didn't have the Bible and had uh, the way they communicated the Old Testament was verbal. So they had stories and they needed those reminders that that picture the presence of these two. And was it real or was it memorized? <laughs> you know. In the time of Jesus, they did have scrolls. They didn't have the codex. The codex wasn't widely used yet. Uh, Christianity really took off the codex, actually, the, the, the book found on one side. Um, in Jesus' day, they mostly used scrolls, but they did at least have a written language that was developed in common use. Uh, both Hebrew in the Old Testament, but also Greek was widely used at the time, and Aramaic for that matter. Uh, but, but yeah, taking this. This is what my Bible says. And especially when you consider the religious teachers of that day. Uh, yeah. I have to be a little careful because I was just doing a little bit of this, a little bit of this, but they'd say, well, this is what the scripture says. And some people say this, and and some people say this, and, and another famous teacher said this, and we don't really know what it means. So when it says Jesus taught with authority. Uh, and that's not in this section, but another, you've seen that in Mark already. People are amazed. Jesus says, this is what God means when he says that. And people are just stunned. How do you know? How can you say that? Wow. He teaches with authority. Uh, but if you're accustomed to, well, this is what God says, and it's kind of hard to understand, and we don't really know. Uh, can you imagine if that's the only kind of teaching you had about the Bible? Would you have confidence that you would know what God had to say? Um, so, um, that, enough on that. Number five, what did they talk about? What did Moses and Elijah talk about with Jesus? About the coming events of the suffering and death. Yes. Uh, where does it say? Oh, it just says they were talking with Jesus. We don't know that from the Mark account, but we do know that from hmm, just did a sermon on this. I should know which gospel is a reference to Luke, Luke? Luke 31. Thank you. From Luke. Um, oh, yeah. See if there's nine. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Pastor. <laughs> oh, open your eyes, Baker. Yeah. <laughs> so in Luke 9, it mentions they talked about his departure. Which, in this context, especially considering before Jesus had just predicted his death and resurrection, and and actually right after this, Jesus is going to again predict his death and resurrection. Also, an interesting note is the word for departure there. I believe is exodus, expedas, um, which is the word used of God saving His people from Egypt. He brought them out. So this is Jesus exodus, the way God saved passing through the Red Sea to deliver from the armies of Egypt. That's what Jesus is going to bring about, not rescue from Egypt, slavery in Egypt, rescue from slavery of sin. That's what Jesus is about to accomplish by his death and resurrection. That's what Moses and Elijah are talking about. God's salvation was through Jesus. So was this like a pep talk to encourage Jesus and to let him know that this was all part of the plan? I mean, do we know what they said? We really don't know what they said, do we? We don't. Um, there may be two possibilities there, and they're not mutually exclusive. One, this was a pep talk for Jesus. Scripture talks in some places Jesus was ministered to by angels after his temptation, and again in the Garden of Eden. Um, Jesus had a human nature that recoiled from the suffering that he was going to undergo. This was his mission. This was the reason that he came, but it wasn't easy. On the other hand, Jesus also brought his disciples with him. So this was also for their benefit, not just for Jesus. Yeah, Otherwise, Jesus could have gone up on his own. Rob, is that you? No, that, I'm sorry. Oh, oh sorry, Mike. Mike. I'm sorry, I don't know. I just chimed in. So Please, Mike. I kind of like your explanation about, hey, the, the, the three of them all appeared together because it kind of 
ties it all together, right? That's one thing for the for the disciples. And then the other thing is that, hey, there is the resurrection. Okay, those they are alive, and Jesus will be alive. I like that. Mm -hmm. That's please. Sentence, Elijah and Moses, then was it the Father, the Spirit, or Jesus, or all? Uh, the book of John talks a little bit about the will of Jesus compared to the will of the Father. And the point that John has to make is everything Jesus does is also the will of the Father. So the scripture itself doesn't distinguish the Holy Spirit sent them, Jesus sent them. It was God's will for them to be there, certainly for the disciples' sake, perhaps also for Jesus' sake. Why did Peter want to build three shelters? Again, well, actually, the article on this one, I think. Uh, why did Peter want to build three shelters? I think he wanted to keep them all there. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Jesus, uh, Moses, Elijah, this is so good. God's glory. Wow. That's what you and I are looking forward to. That's what we get in heaven. Peter gets a taste of that. Yeah, I want that to last forever, too. That's actually my hope. Of confident hope. Why else? Why else? So that, that's one part of it is Peter wanted this to last as long as he could milk it. What else does it say? Because they were frightened. Yeah. They didn't know what else to say. <laughs> you feel kind of bad for these guys, too. You know, you grow up a mountain and this Jesus, <laughs> your best friend, all of a sudden is right, is you cast the sun into shadow and He's holy. You're, you're confronted with your own sinfulness in the in the face of something pure and holy. And then Moses and Elijah are there too. And this is overwhelming. These poor guys. It's great, but it's more than they can handle. It's kind of interesting. Um, sorry. Okay. It's kind of interesting. Peter, you know, time and time again, if there's if there's a boy, he needs to fill it with something. <laughs> he needs to say something, and then he'll think about what he said later. You know what I mean? Peter maybe is the, the apostle whose personality we get to know best. He's a he's a straight shooter and he doesn't mind opening his mouth, even if sometimes his foot follows. Yes. It's kind of cute that Peter actually thinks that Moses and Elijah are willing to leave heaven and stay here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't I find that very cute. Yes. What did the cloud represent? Maybe what does the cloud remind these old test these people raised in old testament history? What does that remind them of? Remind you of you who know your old testament history. <laughs> True. So when God brought his people out of Egypt, they were led by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And then they built the temple. The the temple where they couldn't go in. Was that true of the tabernacle also? Yeah. And yeah, maybe. The maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, where God met with his people, whether that was in the tabernacle or the temple, there God visibly displayed his glory with a cloud. You know, I can meet God there. Now, God says that about Jesus. You can see the Father, whom no one can see. You can see God in the person of Jesus. That's where God comes to me. Today, we don't have the person of Jesus, but God still comes to us, not in a cloud. So we know every time we open our Bible, that's where we can find God. The word not made flesh, but the word grant and spoken and taught. That's where we can meet God today. Number eight, why was it important mm -hmm. for the Father to say what he did? Because of that, by saying that, he told them, this is me, this is my son, this is God, and he's doing what I asked him to do, and I'm pleased with him. 
Yeah, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. So first, confirming you're not just hallucinating. This is what you're supposed to take away from this, from Jesus. Visible glory from Moses and Elijah. God interprets it. This is what you take away. This is my son. This is, Jesus is God. In addition, this is my son whom I love. So everything that he's done, everything that he's taught, and everything he says he's going to do is in line with what I want him to do. So when Jesus says, I'm going to die and rise again, I love him for that. I'm sending him for that reason. We also then have this confidence that when we have, because we have Jesus' perfect life as ours, God also says that about us. This is my son, my daughter, whom I love. God's full approval for Jesus is also his full approval for us who are in him. And finally then, listen to him. Because my son speaks the truth, accurately displays God to you, when he says things that are hard to understand, things that don't match with what you thought you knew, trust him. I love him. This is God. If there's anyone you can trust, it's Jesus. So even when he says, I will go to the cross and leave the tomb empty behind me, even then, listen to him. Why did Jesus command the disciples not to tell anyone what they experienced? They were not <laughs> Do you really think the disciples knew it well enough to actually accurately convey this to someone else at this point? Probably not. <laughs> and not only are the disciples having problems with it, but you, you've read enough of Mark to know that nobody else gets it either. It's the, it'd be the blind leading the blind. Jesus is, Jesus is trying so hard to communicate, this is who I am. This is my mission. This is what I came to do. And it runs so counter to what everyone else expects. Even his own disciples. It's not time yet. <laughs> you need a few more years of seminary training before you go out and preach. <laughs> Number 10, how did Jesus clear up their confusion over seeing Elijah? I don't, I don't love this question. Um, I think what it's getting at is, is this. In the last book of the Old Testament, in Malachi, the prophet Malachi gives a prophecy. Before the Messiah comes, Elijah will come and restore the hearts of God's people. And so that was kind of baked into what the Jews expected then. Before the Messiah comes, we can expect Elijah whatever that looks like. And there were early in Jesus' ministry, people said, maybe Jesus is Elijah. Maybe that means the Messiah is coming soon. Uh, now the disciples see Elijah. Whoa, does that mean the Messiah is coming soon? And Jesus has to clear that up. This, this isn't, the, this transfiguration Elijah isn't the Elijah that Malachi was talking about. Actually, the fulfillment of that prophecy from Malachi, that's from Malachi, right? Yep. Okay. <laughs> uh, the fulfillment of that prophecy from Malachi was the apostle, or was uh, John the Baptist, rather. John the Baptist was the one who turns the hearts of God's people back to God. He preached repentance. And so John prepared God's people for the coming of the Messiah in accord with that prophecy from Malachi. So Jesus has to clear up this confusion then. The Elijah you saw is not the Elijah of Malachi. John the Baptist was the Elijah of Malachi. That was maybe a little complex. You're tracking with me? Maybe. Okay. Um, so Jesus stated that Elijah restores all things. That's not something that fits well with this transfiguration, Elijah. He comes down for a brief chat with Jesus and then disappears. But John the Baptist restores all things by preaching his message of repentance to prepare God's people for his coming. That's how Elijah restores all things, by preaching God's word. Questions on the transfiguration account? All right, then we'll keep moving. 
Number 12. Uh, what were the disciples and the teachers of the law arguing about? They were, that comes in a minute. Before they got to that, before the disciples are arguing about that, Jesus comes down with Peter, James, and John and enters this scene of, of the disciples on one side and, and the teachers of the law on the other, and they're running heads, and, and there's all this angst, and the disciples weren't able to drive out a demon. So there's this demon-possessed boy, and the disciples weren't able to heal him. So, so the argument you can imagine, the, the teachers of the law are having a teachers of the law are having a field day. Ha <laughs> Look, Jesus is Jesus isn't able to do this. He can't be true God after all. He must be a phony because his disciples can't do this thing. And the disciples are going, well, we were sure we could do it. Jesus has done this a million times. Why can't we do it? What must the disciples have thought they possessed for whatever reason? Hmm. They, and, mm -hmm. Power. Yeah. For whatever reason, the disciples thought we should be able to do this. Um, I, I didn't read all eight previous chapters of Mark. Jesus hasn't sent out his disciples yet. Has he? Mm -hmm. I, I think that comes later. So I don't think Jesus has explicitly given his disciples authority to cast out demons. On the other hand, Jesus' response in a minute maybe implies that, that they should have been able to. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know enough. I'm going to stop talking before I take my whole anything first. <laughs> Go ahead. But, but he said that this particular demon needs prayer. Mm -hmm. Didn't they pray for everyone that they healed? So that's that's maybe one of the confusing things about this account. What does Jesus mean? This kind of only comes out with prayer. Makes it sound like there's more than one type of demon. So correct. And, and we have to be a little bit careful not to not to go beyond what God's word says. It seems to give the impression that there's maybe more than one kind of, of demon, maybe. Um, and this kind only comes out with prayer. Go ahead. Uh, just, uh, in her, uh, chapter six. Uh -huh. So he has done that. So he has given them authority to drive out demons. So their assumption we should be able to do, we should be able to do this seems justified, but maybe misses a key point. Jesus sent them out with authority to do that. The disciples can't drive out demons. Jesus can drive out demons. And I think that addresses the, this kind only comes out with, with prayer. Somehow, the disciples were relying on themselves. Prayer, the essence of prayer, uh, First Peter talks about this, humble yourself therefore under God's mighty hand, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. The essence of prayer is submitting yourself to God's will. Whatever God says, his will is good. The disciples thought in themselves something by, by my authority as a disciple of Jesus, because I'm important, because I'm this spiritual leader, because I'm a follower of Jesus, I can cast out a demon. <laughs> no. That's not how it works. There are beings on the spiritual plane more powerful than you and I, much more powerful. However, Jesus is much more powerful than they. So that's not the point of this Bible study, but as Christians, we do affirm the existence of angels and demons, and we also affirm our Lord Jesus' mastery over them. So we don't need to be afraid, not because we can take them head on, but because our Savior has already crushed their power and come to our aid. The disciples had forgotten. Please. The spirits and demons also know who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. So if the disciples would have said in Jesus' name, Maybe it would work. I don't know if, if that may have been a factor. They weren't. It Can seems they that, in Jesus' name. It seems that if they had relied on Jesus, they might have been able to do it. Or rather, Jesus would have accomplished it to them. But it seems that they were relying on themselves. Mm -hmm. 
Note the father's response to Jesus' words in verse 23. This is beautiful. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Uh, that resonates on a, a deep level with many of us, all of us. We, we are both saint and sinner. I, I do believe in Jesus. I trust his will for me. I trust his work for me. I trust that my sins are forgiven and heaven is mine. And still I have a sinful nature that refuses to hear what God has to say and refuses to do what God commands. So I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Pastor. My wife just pointed out I have the wrong verse listed there. Number 14, it should be 24. Thank you. You're right, 23 is everything is possible for one who believes. Yeah. Oh. 24. 24, then the and Father says, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. And I concur with that, David. For me, this is one of the greatest statements by a human, sinful human being in, in the Bible. Because it's so apropos. Yeah, how can you believe if you don't believe? <laughs> it's contradictory, but we understand it. Yes. <laughs> we want belief, to do but we have our doubts. A doubt, right. Every day we are, yeah. we are filled with doubts regarding our faith. Every Help me, Jesus, day. overcome that. There's maybe a, a misconception here that we sometimes fall into that either uh, whenever I sin, I fall away from Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then when I say I'm sorry, then I come back to faith. Or uh, when, when I have mm -hmm. doubts, that must mean that I'm no longer a Christian. This passage, maybe this isn't the clearest place that it's taught, but it's an opportunity to talk about it. Um, I do believe, despite my <laughs> how often I display unbelief, I do believe. Help me overcome it. Uh, that's not what I want. I don't want to continue in this sin. Uh, I do trust you, Jesus, and I struggle with doubt. And that tension remains as long as we are here on this earth. It's not until we finally are in heaven and get to see our Savior face to face that our faith will be perfect. That's kind of why we need encouragement, right? Because these disciples, they were, after a while, listening to Jesus uh, call them out, they must have had some kind of a complex. <laughs> you know, like, when am I going to get this right? Am I ever going to get this right? Well, that's not the point. What the point is, is if you believe, and then comes the unbelief part of it, right? So that's why you make the good point that the verse 23. The transfiguration account is really just that. It's encouragement. <laughs> for you who don't get it, for you who persistently misunderstand Jesus, so Jesus reveals himself to them. He has sent his promises. So his disciples too could say, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And yet the words come from the mouth of not one of his apostles, but a random dude. Somebody maybe like me. Oh, the time is going quickly, guys. Ah. Uh, we'll keep going. Uh, number 15, at this point in his, in his ministry, what was Jesus' focus? Teaching his disciples mm -hmm. and getting ready to die. Right. Yes. Can you blame him? Like, he spent, Jesus does about three years to prepare his disciples, and at his transfiguration, we're getting toward the end of that, and his disciples still don't get it. <laughs> like, guys, come on, you have three years. Ah, so Jesus devotes special time to his disciples. He doesn't become impatient with them, but he continues to teach them. Uh, even as us, I, I can look at myself and say, you've known Jesus for how many years? And you still don't get it? And Jesus still comes through his word and still reveals himself to me and patiently bears with me to help me overcome my unbelief. Mm -hmm. How do I really want to head? <coughs> Let's maybe go down to <coughs> number uh, <coughs> number eighteen. What is the focus of life in the kingdom of Jesus? Uh, 
But this is especially looking at verse 35. So verse 35 says, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. As they seek to live as Jesus' disciple, what's my focus? Be a servant. Be a servant. These disciples who had been arguing, who is the greatest? And so often that's my focus too. How does this benefit me? How can I get something out of this? How do I look compared to others, whether good or bad? Uh, how does what I do for this other person impact me? Jesus turns all that on its head. Whoever would be first in the kingdom is the servant of all. I, I, I don't even know what that looks like. <laughs> I can't imagine forgetting about myself that completely, that I only see the other person. In our epistle reading today, we'll see what that looked like. Jesus crying out in pain because he is denying himself and it's so hard. And he does it perfectly. I don't know what that looks like except that God reveals it to me in Jesus. He was the servant of all. He who was the Lord of the universe became the servant of all who exalts us to the status of children of the king of the universe. And so Jesus' perfect submission is also ours. So go out and serve others as you have been served. Let's close our Bible study much too early with prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for revealing yourself so clearly to your disciples and to us. As we live in this sinful world with our sinful flesh, help us to see you ever more clearly in your word. Help us to serve others as you have served us. Amen. If you want one of the answers to the questions we didn't get to, I'll give you Victor's email address and you can ask him. <laughs> I asked you about half the study pass. We can probably do the rest of it next time. <laughs>